Good morning. I am Elder Sonia Bird. Our scripture for this morning is coming from Habakkuk 1, 2 through 5. It really shows that there is nothing new under the sun. Verses 2 through 4 shows Habakkuk's complaint. And verse 5 is the Lord's answer. Let's read. How long, Lord, must I call for help? But you do not listen or cry out to you violence. But you do not save. Why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrongdoing? Destruction and violence are before me. There is a strife and conflict abounds. Therefore, the law is paralyzed and justice prevails. The wicked hem in the righteous so that justice is perverted. The Lord's answer, and I encourage you, family, get ready. Verse 5. Look at the nations and watch and be utterly amazed for I am going to do something in your days that you will not even believe even if you were told. Father God, in the awesome name of Jesus, we come. We thank you for your word, God, and we thank you that you are sovereign and that you are Lord. We come before you, God, with humble hearts, and we come asking you to forgive us for things that we did not pleasing to you. Lord, forgive us of those sins of omission, those sins of commission, those sins, God, that were we just failed and missed the mark. Forgive us and create within us, Claude, clean hearts and renew within us minds acceptable to you. Oh, God. We thank you for being a God that hears and answers prayers. And we come before you, God, asking that you invade every home and every person that's listening today with your presence, God. And I thank you right now for the spiritual blessings that you are manifesting in their life. And my prayer, God, is that you withhold no good thing for them. We do declare that you are our shepherd and we lack nothing, even in this season. But Lord, we come asking you have mercy right now on the bereaved families who've lost loved ones for various reasons, and especially those that have lost loved ones to this pandemic, the COVID-19 virus. Have mercy on those, Lord, that are struggling and dealing with the virus. We believe and know that you are a healer, and we pray for healing, God, in every aspect. Hallelujah. We declare by your stripes we are healed, and we give you glory and praise for manifesting it in our bodies and in this season, in the name of Jesus. Lord, I lift up the kingdom to you and I pray for all the saints all over the land and country, all the pastors and shepherds that are uh, shepherding during this season, God, that with unknown and unanswered questions, bless them, Lord. Hallelujah. And Lord, we lift up our pastor to you, Patrick Lamar McGrew Sr. And we thank you, God, for continuing to crown him with wisdom and for revelation being poured out of his belly. Bless his family. Bless his wife. Bless his hands, God, as he ministers during this time. Hallelujah. Glory, hallelujah. We pray, God, hallelujah, for your peace and your presence to reign. And as your word says, we acknowledge that you are sovereign and none of this surprises you. But we'll be on guard to look and listen and see how you bring us out. Lord, I ask that you have mercy upon these United States of America. And I say, God bless America and bless those that are in charge of us. Lord, we also pray for the peace of Jerusalem. You declared that we would even prosper. Bless that country, God. We thank you, we love you, we acknowledge you, and we go in faith knowing that all things are working for the good of those that are called by you. Be glorified in this day, in this service, and in the lives of your people. Amen. Welcome, Higher Praise Family Church and friends, and thank you if this is your first time tuning in with us. You're in for an anointed word from God. You know, these are strange times that we're getting to experience. And we're encouraging everyone to stay safe and stay connected. Call 
Facebook church family or text somebody if you haven't seen them in a while. Stay connected with your small group. Also, join Pastor on Wednesday night for Bible study on Zoom. Last Wednesday, we learned the source of anger and what to do with it. And don't forget the children. This Sunday begins Vacation Bible School for them. So put them on Zoom immediately after this service. Church is not closed. We are the church. So experience God's presence in service today. greatness of our God. I know that what's going on around you, closest to you, may not seem like the best situation, but remember that God is there and that he's greater than anything that you can encounter. Water you turned into wine. Open the eyes of the blind. There's no about his goodness. Water you turn into wine. <laughs> Open the eyes of the blind. There's no one like you. No, no one like you. Into the darkness, say. Into the darkness you shine. And out of the ashes. the greatest. Think about the goodness of the Lord. He's with you right now. Hallelujah. Here we go. Uh, listen. And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then no one can stand against us.
<laughs> then what can stand against? Then what can stand against? Yeah, yeah. There's no one can stand against me. What can stand against? No stand against. Oh. Listen. What are you turned into wine? Open the eyes of the blind. There's no one like you. There's no one like you. Say it. None like you. All eyes focus on him and his greatness. Let him be enlarged in your mind right now. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Magnify him in your own thinking. With your own lips, begin to tell him how great he is, how strong he is. He is able to carry you, able to keep you, able to watch over you, provide for you and your loved ones. God is greater. He's awesome in power. For those of you who are sick, he's a healer. Yes, he is. He'll touch your body. He'll send his word and heal you. He's a faithful God. There is nothing impossible for him. Father, we thank you. Thank you for your greatness. Thank you for your strength. Good morning and welcome to Higher Praise Family Church. I'm Justin. I'm Amara. And these are your Sunday morning announcements. Join HPFC in Israel Recognition Sunday each first Sunday of the month. A special offering will be taken up and given to Israel as we eagerly expect to see what God sees. We sure hope you will join us. Join King's Kids for VBS on Zoom throughout the month of July following Sunday morning service. Calling Presbytery leadership and heads and hands. Join Zoom every Sunday at 4 p.m. for a time of update. Join us for corporate prayer and Bible study. Check out our Facebook page for more information. Here are a few health tips that can keep all of us safe as we go through this time of the coronavirus. Are we all knowing what signs and symptoms we need to look for? If we have a fever, that fever will spike. So it might be 98, 99, that's a wonderful thing. Anything over 99, we have a problem. We'll have that dry cough. <coughs> we don't want that dry cough. If that dry cough is there, that's another sign. We wanna make sure if we have those signs that we're letting someone know. Does that mean you go to the ER? No, you pick up the phone and you call first. This is the signs and symptoms, and they'll ask you a few questions. There is a, also a .gov, G-O-V, site that you can get on, and it will ask you the questions that the doctor or the nurse is gonna ask you. Make sure we're looking for a fever. Make sure we're looking for, do I have a dry cough? Make sure when you're coughing, we're not coughing into our hand, we're coughing into the front part of our elbow, or we're coughing into some tissue. After you use that tissue, don't lay it down, throw it away. Have a question during pastor sermon? Drop your questions in the chat window. Be sure to reach out to these saints this week and show them some birthday love. This concludes our morning announcements. Make it a great day and a significant week. Wait just one minute before we continue with service. Have you subscribed to our YouTube channel? Take a quick second, scroll down, and hit that big red subscribe button. And hit that little bell too, so you're notified when new sermons are posted. Be sure to stay connected through the week by visiting us on Facebook, listening to or watching the latest sermon, either through podcasts or YouTube, or visit our website. Well, good morning, higher praise. It's time for an offering. Woo! 
Romans chapter 5 verse 8 says, While we were yet sinners, God displayed his own love by sending his son Christ to die for us. All right, you guys have to understand in Bible times, to die for somebody else meant everything. To save someone's life meant that you owed them your life now, right? Okay, so Elder Butler teaches that, that worship is love expressed. Did you guys know that giving is a form of worship? So how much should we give? How much love can we express to someone who came and died for us while we were yet sinners, while we were undeserving? We should give anything that we got. If it's $100, if it's $50, if it's $2, I should give it if I have the opportunity. We know that in this church, we tithe. We believe in giving the tithe, which is 10% of our earnings. We also believe in giving an offering, which is above our tithes. We know that we also give to our sweet spot, which benefits someone here in this house. So what can you do? How do you give? You can go on Givelify. Many of you have already downloaded the app and you've been faithful giving on Givelify. If you don't have Givelify accessible and you want to send your check in or your cash in, you can mail it to 2909 Horton Road, Forest Hill, Texas, 76119. All right, let us cover this offering. God, we just want to thank you for today, Father. Yes, Lord, we just want to thank you for today, oh God, for everything that you've already done for us, oh God. Yes, Lord. Lord, and now we ask, oh God, we ask that you take this offering and you do more with it than we could ever, ever, ever imagine, oh God. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, oh God. You have the power, oh God. You have the ability, Father. You are omnipotent, oh God. Yes, Lord. So we just ask that you take it and you do it, oh God. Lord, I ask a special blessing to those who gave, oh God, even when it was hard to give, Father. Yes, Lord. We seal this in your darling son, Jesus' name. Amen.
and he's worthy. worthy of <laughs> my heart will sing. Me. Sing with me how great yeah. is our God. Oh, oh, see how great, how great, how great is, our is our God. Is our God is a great and greatly to be praised. How, how great is our God. How great is our God. Yeah, yeah. Nobody like you, Lord. Nobody like you, Lord. Nobody like you, Jesus. Yeah, yeah. How great is our God. Yes. He's a great God. Yes, he is. Yeah, yeah. How great. How great. How great. How great. How great. How great is our God. Hallelujah, yeah, yeah. How we honor you, O oh God. How we magnify you, dear God. Good morning, higher praise, family church. Uh, thank you so much for tuning in this morning. Let's run to the word of the Lord, coming from John chapter 21, verses 1 through 10. John chapter 21, verses 1 through 10. Reading from the New International Version. Afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. It happened on this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, Thomas, also known as Didymus, Nathaniel from Canaan, Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them, and they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat. But that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, I have, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciples whom Jesus loved, the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire burning of coals with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you have just caught. Father, how we love you and bless you. Thank you for this time and opportunity. We invite your spirit to come teach us this morning. Thank you in advance for revelation knowledge and above all understanding as we seek to traverse these times in which we live. Thank you for handles for our faith. Thank you for revelation and understanding today. We give you praise. We give you glory and honor in Christ's name. Amen. Well, again, good morning, family. Let me tag this text this morning as we run um, quickly. 
Um, there's still a lot going on in our society, again, with our um, pandemic. Um, so I pray you are staying safe and um, following protocol, um, even as we are endeavoring and planning um, at the appropriate time to open. We still are not opening full service. And so please stay tuned for announcements um, as we um, prepare for that um, at the appropriate time. But I want to tag this text this morning. I want to speak um, to this house um, from John 21, 1 through 10. Um, proper progression. Proper progression. So when I look in um, at the context of uh, the church and the kingdom in light of secular society, um, many would say that we have, if we look at time historically, as a people, as a black people, um, as a church, um, that there has been progress made. And progress is good. Progress, I believe, is seen. Um, but I believe um, the focus should be progression rather than progress. And I say that when I look contextually and look um, via semantics, the wording of progression and progress, and I see that uh, most people may not recognize, but there is a slight nuance um, and a slight difference that I believe that if we overlook, it will cause us to continue to miss out on all that God has for us. God, Jesus said in John 10 and 10, I've come that you may have life, and not just life, but life to the full or the abundant life. And many times I believe that we um, acquiesce and accept life but jettison the abundant life, and I believe it is because we often overlook small nuances in God's word. And so if we look just um, semantically at progress and progression, I think um, hopefully and prayerfully at the end of um, our pedagogy this morning, um, you will conclude that we need proper progression and not just progress. Well, how do you define progress? Progress um, defined by Webster's is is movement or advancement through a series of events or points in time or development through time. In other words, progress will suggest that over time and even in the definition, one of the definition in progress, um, they define natural progress. So in most instances or many instances, um, progress is seen or understood to happen or occur naturally by time, that time and the consequence or the process of time creates progress. And I think in general, if we just look, if you look over the last 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, in different arenas, different fields, because time has moved, uh, has moved or time has elapsed, um, you can see progress in those areas. Change in, in certain areas. Progression, defined as movement forward, especially one that advances towards some achievement. And I think that is apropos, and that is the relevant point that is overlooked in progress, um, that is distinguished by progression. When there is progression, there is advances towards some achievement, something is obtained. The reality is what I'm saying and the foundation and the groundwork I'm laying today is that you can have the elapse of time. 20 years can go by. Things can look differently than they looked 20 years ago, and that is progress. However, at the same time, just because there is progress, that things look different than they looked 20 years ago, it does not automatically stipulate that things have changed. Lord, help me. And so what happens, we buy into this secular understanding of progress, and we assume that since time has elapsed, things have changed and that there is progress. And so because of the elapse of time and what has happened over time, the change in time is considered progress. And so many people will tout that applaud that, I suggest that we look deeper and, and not just look for progress, but look for progression. What has been achieved 
as opposed to what has changed. <laughs> because just because things have changed doesn't mean you have changed. Let that soak in. Let's look at that contextually. When I look at the civil rights movement and as it relates to civil rights, there has been progress from the 60s. But my question is, has there been progression in the 60s? Black men were murdered on the streets and women, children. Today, they're still murdered on the streets. But we have, we have progress because we have laws that say you shouldn't discriminate. Again, progress can exist and progression can be null and void. Progress is good, but progression and progression must be prioritized. There must be advances towards some achievement. Something must be achieved or obtained, not just changed. Um, so there can be, um, from the term in economics, there can be macro progress, but there can be micro progression. In other words, there can be seemingly a lot of change but there can be so little achievement. When I look um, even further to bear this concept out, I believe it is bared out and affirmed when we look at fitness progression. Um, back in the early 90s or late 90s when I first moved here, I used to um, train at Bally's and went through different um, trainer certifications. So I learned about fitness and fitness progression. And one of the things that um, physiology suggests is that if you want to get in shape, that there must be fitness progression. In other words, and fitness progression states that you should increase overload, overload. In other words, you have to stress your muscles if you want them to respond. And they will respond, get stronger, um, look better, perform better. Um, by components such as one, frequency of training, intensity of training, time in training, and the type of training. In other words, fitness progression suggests that progression is the consequence of intentionality. In other words, you have to be intentional about training in order to get benefits. Lord help me. In other words, you don't just get in shape over time going back to our definition of progress, just because time elapse, elapses, just because one year passes by does not assume at the end of a year you will be physically fit. The only way to get physically fit is to have fitness progression. You must have frequency, intensity, time, and type of activities, various activities to impact and influence muscle growth development and change. Goes on to say when it talks about um, fitness progression that not only uh, must you have frequency, you must exercise your muscles um, frequently. Not only must you have intensity, you must have a lot, you must exert energy and effort when you work out. Also, there must be the element of time, how long you engage in exercise. And then also the type the types of exercises, for instance, the arm, you have a bicep and a tricep. So you have to work both of those muscles or various types of exercises to work those two different types of muscles. Very important. So targeted exercise improves. So again, if exercise is not targeted, it cannot be qualified as fitness progression. Can I submit that these principles are the same when we talk about um, economic progress, spiritual progress, social progress, and progression, that we must be intentional. And without intentionality, there can be no progression. I'll say that again. Without intentionality, there can be no progression. If I look at this text this morning, um, the background, the stage is being set. We see um, before we get to chapter 21, 
um, chapter 20 is really setting us up for what I suggest um, proper progression is. When we look in the context, we look in chapter 20, Mary Magdalene, um, she, uh, chapter 20 um, specifically talks and tells the story of Mary Magdalene, how she uh, comes in contact with Christ. She has her conversion. She moves on. She's a part of his crucifixion. She um, then goes, she's a part of the resurrection, and then she's moving on to the next phase of her life. She's going to the next progression. And so to me, this speaks again of proper progression, her conversion to his crucifixion, to his resurrection, to now she's been ushered in to the next phase, the next season, the next assignment in her life. Can I suggest that proper progression places at the point of our lives where we are changed from glory to glory, but then also we move along our path of purpose and destiny where God prepares us and equips us for more um, to whom much is given, much is required. But also he says, if you're faithful over a little, I'll make you rule over much. And so proper progression for the life of the believer as we're changed from glory to glory. I'm suggesting that our responsibility increases, that our workload increases, that God, he, he, he matures our body, our spiritual muscle, because he wants to assign us more. He wants to give us more. And if we look at our society today, man, if we look at our society today, the church or the world is in need of the church stepping up and more people taking on a, a, a broader perspective of the kingdom and responsibility we have in transforming this world. It's time out for um, the 80-20, where 80% of the church is kind of on a periphery, just kind of hanging out, um, as we see in uh, the, the Gospels with the multitudes just following along for sandwiches and following along for the miracles and just kind of showing up you know, for the big services, but not really involved in passing out the fish, not really involved in laying on the hands, not really involved in the day-to-day -day work of ministry, not really um, representing light and salt, just kind of on the periphery. But God is calling us to progression, and that's what proper progression is really all about. It's about the body of Christ taking ownership, responsibility of being and doing more in the kingdom as God assigns as he prepares for his return. And so we see this, first of all, in Mary Magdalene. And then we see um, two in the disciples as he prepares them in chapter 20, um, John chapter 20. He gives them um, what I call apostolic order. The Bible says he breathed on them. It says receive the Holy Spirit. So now he imparts the Holy Spirit to them. There's this new birth. They've been walking with him. Now um, they go to their next dimension. They are progressing, not just walking with him, but he says receive this impartation. There's more for you to do. There's another assignment. I'm not going to be here much longer. I need you to walk in purpose. I need you to walk in power. I need you to walk in your next progression, the next thing I have you to walk in. And so he empowers them with such. And then number three, we see doubting Thomas. He is trying to move Thomas through this um, scenario of progression from doubting to believing to walking in his purpose and destiny. And so we see Thomas, first of all, um, this context, and Christ tells him, you know, Thomas says, I'll believe if you show me. The end of this scenario, Christ says, man, blessed are those who have believed and have not seen me. In other words, Thomas, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. If you just would have believed the testimony of others, you could have been to a place. You could have been farther along the word. But since you want to see and there's doubt in you, come on, I will still help you to progress. That's good news for us today, because all of us sometimes all of us, I believe, have some Thomas in us. We have some doubts. We have some fears. We have some apprehensions in crisis here today. And so there's some things you may be reluctant to participate in. You may be fearful about fully walking in. But watch this. Christ is here today to help you in progression just as Thomas, to move to the next thing that he wants you to achieve and accomplish in the kingdom. So progression, again, so we're talking about progression. P progression, if I can give you a framework, a philosophical framework for progression. Number one, progression speaks of movement ordained by God. In other words, I suggest this morning that there is movement characterized by decisions that we make, who we will marry, what we will major in, what church I attend. There are major decisions in our lives that represent movement in God. And God wants you to be equipped to properly progress in this decision making so you can be effective in your witnesses being light and salt. Number two, progression speaks of 
of your own personal purpose and destiny. You have to realize and be reminded this morning that God has a significant plan and purpose for your life. Um, We're reminded of Jeremiah 29 and 11 that God knows the plans and the purposes that he has for you. Plans to prosper you. Listen, if your life is not flowing in abundance, if you're not flowing in the abundance of God, you're not there yet. There is still progression there. God is he wants not just progress. He wants there to be proper progression, proper movement in your life to get you to this place of prosperity. Lord, help me. And I'm not just talking money. He wants your emotional life to flourish. He wants your psychological life to flourish. There is so much that God has designed and so much he desires for us. And he's pouring out his spirit. And through this process of progression, he's making it available today. Lord, help me today. So number three, progression speaks of what I suggest this critical mass that is required and needed to compose the unseen complexities of the simple singular moments in time that lead to defined seasons in our lives. In other words, there are decisions that you make that will forge seasons. In other words, there are seasons that are precipitated by decisions that you make. In other words, there are some decisions you will make that will develop a season or the next season of your life. And so that is imperative that we make proper decisions for this next season because our decisions dictate our season. Progression also speaks of your decision to trust, to fully trust God. In other words, there is a part of progression that will never be experienced until you fully trust God with your life. And I get it. That's one of the hardest things to do, to to trust God with everything you have, everything you own. But that is the season that we are in. God is calling us to total trust and only progression is the antidote to get us to trust God. Progression also speaks of the realization that life without Christ is a life with blood, sweat and some tears and nights with empty nets. So like the disciples, it's time for us to find out in this season we will find out. And when we properly when we experience proper progression, we realize that without Christ, my life has empty nets and we can fish all night. We can toil all night. Um, we can have pursuits for years. And some of us are in this predicament this morning. We have empty nets. We've spent long, tiresome hours trying to obtain, obtain something, trying to get something, trying to receive something. <coughs> and at the end of it all, we still have empty nets. Can I suggest the antidote to empty nets is proper progression. Progression speaks of the reality of John 10 and 10 and Christ says, I've come that you may have life and life more abundantly. Are you ready for the abundant life? Are you ready for more in God in this season? We have declared and decreed this season that we will not just survive, we will thrive. And man, I'm still getting testimonies. People are paying off houses. Um, Student loan debt is being canceled and removed. And God is doing phenomenal things. And so jump aboard. This is the time for proper progression. It's time that we fully prosper in the Lord. Amen. Let's look at our text, verses one through three. Um, We see what I would suggest is the challenge. Of course, the disciples here at this time, text one through three, um, verses one through three of chapter 21. Chapter 21, verses one through three. The disciples have participated in the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Uh, not Easter. This is the Feast of Unleavened Bread and the Passover. We call it Easter, um, but that's where we get our Easter from. But it is the Passover, Jewish holiday. The disciples now are with Christ. He's given them the commission. Um, he's told them to breathe, um, told them to receive the Holy Spirit in chapter 20. Um, and something unique is happening. Peter goes back. Christ has been raised from the dead. Of course, um, before he ascends to heaven, He has his encounter with the disciples. And so we have Peter, of course. Uh, What happened with Peter? Christ tells Peter, you'll deny me uh, three times before the cock crows. It happens. And so now we're in that. And so now Peter goes back to what he used to do. He goes back to fishing. Lord help. When there is an opportunity for proper progression, it always begins, as with Peter, with a faith confrontation. In other words, the challenge 
is that your faith will always be confronted. Here's the good news. When your faith is confronted, know that God is desirous to move you in progression. He's designed to progress you. Why? Because we are changed from glory to glory. We'll move from faith to faith. And so when your faith is confronted, when your faith is challenged, it's because God is doing a deeper work in you. So do not get mad at someone. Do not get mad at the situation. Don't get frustrated with other people or other things because God is ready to promote you when your faith is confronted. And so here's the cycle. You know the cycle. Peter denies Christ. Um, he denies the denial and he goes back to fishing. He goes back to doing what he used to do. The, the, the issue is the Bible says he caught nothing. He caught nothing. Why? Because God says you can't go back to doing the same thing you used to do. Listen, when your faith is confronted, the antidote is not doing what you used to do. Lord, let me say that again. When your faith is confronted, it is a confrontation and a challenge for something new, not something old. Lord, help me. It seems like it's something old. But when your faith is confronted, it is always, listen, it is always to usher you into something new. To go back to what you used to do is counterproductive. And that is exactly what Peter did. He denies his own denial. How does he do that? He doesn't, he doesn't say it. But he, does, he denies his own denial by going back to doing what he used to do. Can I suggest higher praise uh, this morning and encourage you this morning that if your faith is under fire, if there is a challenge in front of you, if there is something for you to overcome, listen, doing what you used to do is not the answer. <laughs> Lord, help me. Let, me. let me hurry. Verses four through six. Um, when we look at verses four through six. Um, Christ comes. Um, he asks them for some. So he calls them friends and kind of surprises them. Um, asks them for some fish. And was, what is this about? Um, the question really is, why did the disciples not recognize Christ? Hmm. In progression, when God is desirous to move you to your next dimension. He will always assess your relationship with him. I'll say that again. When God desires to progress you, to move you to your next dimension, he will always question the soundness and the strength of your relationship with him. So watch this in verses four through five. He asks, or he says, he calls out to them friends. And so watch this, I suggest, how does he call them friend when they don't recognize him? How can you call someone friend and they don't know who you are? I suggest this morning that Christ is speaking prophetically to them and he's not necessarily speaking to them where they are, he's speaking to them where they are going to be. Lord, that's good news. The good news is that when Christ calls us to assess our relationship, he's suggesting that he's more intentional about the relationship than you are, and that we are. That's good news. That is, that is great news because I found in my relationship with God and his son is that many times and most of the time, he's more intentional about our relationship than I am. Lord help. I'll say that again. He's more intentional about our relationship than I am. In other words, sometimes because of my busyness, sometimes because of my fatigue, sometimes because of my interest. And there are myriad of things of other priorities that I may have on my plate or on my agenda that will cause me to um, put our relationship on hold. But what I have found is that when I put our relationship on hold, he never does. Lord help, that he is always intentional about maturing Patrick, about growing Patrick and about being in a real relationship with Patrick. And so when we talk about proper progression, God always brings us to a place where he wants us to assess our relationship with him. And he will call us and treat us as more than than we really deserve. He calls them friend and they can't recognize him. 
Lord help. Has he ever called you friend and you, you haven't really recognized him that he's he's right there in the midst. He's right there providing. He's right there giving solutions. He's right there giving you answers. And we don't even recognize his friendship or the, or the relationship. And so proper progression deals. Number one is Christ. Is God confronting? Is there a faith confrontation? Number two, is he asking you to assess your relationship with him? And here's the change. Here's the change. Look at verse six. So they've been fishing all night, caught nothing, going back to the old ways, what they used to do. And he says, cast your net on the right side and you will find some. This is interesting because uh, Research would let us know that as fishermen, um, if they were fishing all night and didn't catch nothing, there were a couple of strategies that they could have done to improve their chances. They could have went further out into the ocean to catch fish, or they could have dropped their nets a little deeper. So if they were in a place that was kind of somewhat shallow, they could move out and drop their nets further, or they could just go out further into deep waters. But Christ tells them something strange. He says, stay where you are. Watch this. Stay where you are. Just move your net. Put your net on the right side. Now in their minds, I can only imagine that strategy seems futile because it's just from one place to another. I was I had my net on the left side. And you said move it to the right. It seems because we're familiar with fishing. We need to go out into the deep to get more fish. Can I suggest this morning that when we talk about progression, that God will always tell you something or give an instruction, give a command that does not necessarily make sense to you. Hmm. This is the season when we are in proper progression, where we live and walk by faith and not by sight. And so watch this. He says, the command was cast your net on the right side and you will find some. The word find in the Greek is loaded. It means really to attain a state or condition. So in other words, he says, if you put your net on the right side, watch this. He's suggesting with the Greek grammar that you will change your condition. Lord, does, is, does anyone need their condition change? Again, we're talking about proper progression, moving to a place of abundance and prosperity, not lack, not confusion, not less than. And so he says to change your condition, he says, put your net on the right side. Watch this. It also suggests to come upon through search. In other words, I'm going to take the guesswork out. And it's, 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 it's only accident if something you tried on your own volition and you're not sure. So here's the certitude. The certitude is I created everything. I know where the fish are. Put your net on the right side. Just trust me. One of the things we fail to remember is that when God gives us commands is that he is omniscient. He's all knowing. So before you put your net on the right side, he already knows. Lord, help. he already knows what's on the right side. So he says, put your net on the right side. Can I suggest that the commands of God are steeped in his omniscience? And that's what makes that's what gives us the credence to trust him because he knows he knows. So if you want to change your condition. So in this process of progression, he says, trust me enough and I'll change your condition. If you put your net on the right side, watch this. Not only um, does he say I'll change your condition, he says you will find um, some fish. Now, watch this. There are three different levels of this word. Some in the Greek um, understanding, it can mean an unspecified amount. It can mean a least amount and it can also mean a considerable amount. So watch this. Watch this. What is typically determined and what typically determines what this sum is, is our level of obedience. I'll say that again. So what so what determines what's used here is is a, is a conjunctive, which means there is a possibility. And the possibility is made a possibility only because it's steeped in man's decision. If it were just up to God. There's only, watch this, there's only a considerable amount of fish. It becomes less than that. It can be an unspecified amount of fish. It can be a, a minimum amount of fish because he says, I'm not going to make you put your net on the right side. I'm going to tell you and then I'm going to leave it up to you. 
Lord have mercy. Can we really, can, can we just conclude that the lack in our lives or the confusion in our lives, the disappointments in our lives many times are steeped in our unwillingness to just do what he said, put our net on the right side, because in our own mind, it doesn't make that much sense. So he says, cast your net on the right side and I will change your condition. The Bible goes on to say they, of course, were obedient and it says they could not pull in the net because of the amount of fish. Cast your net. So what is this progression? So how can we define progression? If you want to move from mediocrity to this place of proper progression, this proper movement in God, this proper purpose in God, then you must be fully obedient. Full obedience is the key to productivity. Number one, full obedience is the key to productivity. Number two, progression is conditioned by faith, not by sight. Progression is conditioned by faith and not by sight. In other words, when I am moving in faith, not fear, it will mitigate against inconsistency and compromise. The way that I combat inconsistency in my life and compromise in my life, watch this, is walking by faith. Can I just suggest that we are in a season where everything that God commands may not make sense to you, but do not make making sense a prerequisite for obedience. I'll say it again. Do not make making sense a prerequisite for obedience. Make faith a prerequisite. So if God is leading you by faith, walk by faith and not by sight. Sight will cause you what you see, what you feel, what you believe. And your past experience in isolation will cause you to miss proper progression. And last, when we look at Peter, the Bible says in verse four, listen to this. The disciples see Jesus. They don't recognize him. He calls them friends. John recognizes who he is, calls him by name. Peter then, watch this, because he was fishing, had taken off his outer garment, inner garment, puts it on, and then runs to see him. Why? Because he recognizes, and let me run to a close on this part, he recognized in order for me to have proper progression, there's some things I have to put on. Lord have mercy. In other, in other words, there's some things that God is calling me to do I cannot do without proper clothing. Lord help. It speaks of vulnerability and it speaks of Adam and Eve when they were in the garden and had disobeyed God. The Bible says that they ran and they hid because they were naked and ashamed. Lord help me now. One of the things that will keep the church and that is keeping the church from moving and progressing the way it is supposed to and performing at maximum level in the context of a dying world. In other words, why we can't perform is because we are ashamed. We're naked and ashamed. And that's why last week I said um, we have to deal with what? We have to deal with the sin in our lives. Why? Because when God begins to deal with us, he begins to pull off the layers. And so now, as Watchman Nee suggests, when, we, when the inner man and the outward man is broken, that through this brokenness, God is able to use we as his children effectively. And so Peter realizes now I have to put something on. I have, to, I have to put something on if I'm going to be effective in this season. Number one, what do we need to put on humility? This is the season, and this is one of the hardest lessons I'm learning, is we have to be humble in this season. In other words, we don't have to have all the answers in this season. Thank you, Holy Ghost, that we have someone and we serve someone who does have all the answers. And so that takes the pressure off of us. And so humility means that, listen, watch this, that in this season of progression, I can just follow the Lord. I can be obedient to the Holy Spirit and not have to be the boss. I don't have to have, I don't have to be the expert in this season. Thank you, Holy Ghost. So we have to put on humility. Number two, we have to, of course, put on love. Colossians 3.14. Um, give you the scripture. First Peter 5.5. 5, put on humility. 
humility. Number two, um, Colossians 3, 14, put on love. Of course, you know, love covers, love covers a multitude of faults. Romans 13, 12, put on light. The Bible says we are light and salt. We're living in a dark world. You need to put on light. God is calling us to put on light. If we're going to have proper progression in this season, if we're going to move properly in this season, if we're going to be in this place of influence that God has ordained for our lives, we have to put on light. Number four, Ephesians 4, 24. We have to put on, watch this, the new self. Yes, this is the season we put on the new self. And that's why I say doing what we used to do is outdated. The old way, the old strategies. We saw that with Peter going back to what he used to do and he caught nothing. Listen, if we're going to be productive, we've got to put on the new self in Jesus name. Number five, of course, uh, five is a number for grace. If we're going to be victorious in battle, Ephesians 6 and 11, we have to put on the full armor, put on the full armor of God. Number six, if we're going to be have proper progression, not only must we put on the full armor of God, we have to put on Christ. Romans 13, 14, we have to put on Christ. When I talk about putting on Christ, I really talk about putting on his word. We have to arm ourselves with his word. This is the seed. You have to know the word. You have to know the word. Know the word. And last but not least, um, number seven, um, you have to put on power. Luke 24, 49, put on God's power. Acts reminds us that when the Holy Spirit comes upon us, you shall receive power. And last, when we look at this text, verse 10, verse 10, Christ asks the disciples, now give me some of the fish you have caught. To me, this is profound and it sets this um, paradigm, this model up and actually puts a book, places a book in on this model. When we talk about proper progression, um, we see that Christ concludes by asking them, watch this, to participate in what God does. Giving. So he asked them, now give me some of the fish you caught. In other words, I want you to divest yourself of what you've placed your energy and effort into. This is profound. It's simple, but it's profound. And it goes back to a model that David taught us uh, when he sacrificed. He says, I will not sacrifice that which costs me nothing. And so now Christ in this New Testament example, this New Testament model is asking them in this time of revelation, this time of understanding, he's asking them to give. Why? Because giving places us in a position of strength like God. Giving initiates and inaugurates the law of reciprocity. The only way for our lives to be to be to experience abundance is through reciprocity. Sowing and reaping. So when I sow a seed, watch this, I reap a harvest. And so God says, and he shows through his son in his last instance, he wraps this text up. When we talk about proper progression, he tells his disciples, if I'm about to leave, but I want to remind you of this principle, I want to remind you of this concept of the kingdom, that if you're going to be productive, if you're going to flourish, your lives have to be one of sacrificial giving. And so here I am, I'm asking you to give me of what you have, what you have sown. Give me what you have sweated over. Give me what you have sacrificed for. Give me what you have worked for. And that is a sign, watch this, that your heart is really belong or belong has been converted to me. And so when we talk about proper progression, this model that we're suggesting from John chapter 21, verses one through seven, how does it begin? Again, always with the faith confrontation. Is your faith being confronted today? Is there a challenge in your life today that will make you scratch your head or make you wonder what is God doing? It's because he wants to progress or he wants to move you to your next place in him. He always checks our relationship, the context of your faith confrontation is always relationship. And then change. It's time for true change. So my question is, where are you today when we talk about proper progression? What is the state of your life today? Is your life flowing in abundance? Is it overflowing? Is it flourishing? Can I remind you this morning that that is God's plan for your life, that you flourish, 
that you prosper, be in health, even as your soul prosper. God just, he doesn't want you just on your way to heaven. He wants you prospering and flourishing in this season. And listen, when I look around society, when I look around our world today, there's so much that is anti-flourishing, anti-prospering. I want to remind our house today, I want to remind higher praise this morning that God has called us to prosper. He's called us to flourish, but we can only flourish in proper progression. Father, we bless you today. We honor you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for revelation, knowledge, and understanding. I pray, Lord, that you would grab our hearts this morning. I pray, Lord, that you would fix our minds on the reality of proper progression, of what it means to not just allow time to pass, but what does it mean and how does it look to really move and mature in you to the degree that our lives are overflowing with abundance, that our lives are prosperous, that our lives are healthy, our bodies are healthy, our minds and emotions are healthy and flourishing. Help us to have proper progression. If you're here today and need prayer, there's a prayer line. We're here to pray for you. Our intercessory prayer team, you may need salvation or want to get connected to a church. You can do that in this hour and in this season. So get connected. Stay connected. Get plugged in. We love you. Praying for you, higher praise, believing God's best. And listen, we are more than just surviving. We are thriving. And God is reminding us weekly, giving us strategies, handles for our faith, word to remind us, to encourage us, to grow, to mature, to be all he's called us to be. So challenges are good. It gives us an opportunity to have a faith confrontation but to grow in our faith, assess our relationship with him, and then whatever changes we need to make, make those changes. Remind ourselves that he knows all things. So if he says, cast our net on the right side, cast your net on the right side. Listen, God's instructions and commands are for your benefit. I'll say it again. God's commands and instructions are for your benefit. He wants what's best for you. And I guarantee you, if you obey him, your life will, will flourish. And proper progression is the consequence and abundance is manifested in your life, will be manifested in your life. Again, we have to put on some things, put on humility, put on love, put on light, put on the new self, put on the full armor, put on Christ and put on the power of the Holy Spirit. We love you. Praying for you. The best is still yet to come. Are you interested in making Higher Praise Family Church your new home? Head on over to the website and hit contact us in the top right corner. You'll get added to our church roster and get plugged into a discipleship group. Hey, thank you so much for tuning in to Higher Praise Family Church and our YouTube channel. Can I admonish you, please subscribe to our channel and share it with your family and friends. Also want to invite you to follow us on social media as well as visit our website at www.higher-praise.org.